And thank you everyone for joining us. And um, this presentation, Special Inspection for Wood Construction BCD 710-1. And as Mar Marcy mentioned, I'm Michelle Cambiron, Senior Director of Education. Thank you for joining us. And we realize that all of you have a busy day. We appreciate you joining us and watching this seminar. The presentation is copyrighted by American Wood Council. If you'd like to use any portion of that, you can contact us. And for those of you that didn't hear Marcy, there are a handout portion in your docking system of GoToWebinar where the presentations, you can just download it from there or also Marcy, or uh, I'm sorry, Lori has also provided a link to the PDF of the presentation. There are some minor tweaks that I'll point out in the presentation that we found from the previous webinar that we're going to incorporate into this presentation. Now the presentation is uh, also approved for continuing education for AIA, ICC, and NCSEA. We have the description here and the learning objective, which all of you have been provided with when you registered for the webinar. So we'll start off with a first poll. This is always, we typically do this and to see what the makeup of the audience is. And the question is, what is your profession? A, architect, B, engineer, C, code official, D, fire service, and E, builder, manufacturer, and other. And we're limited in the number of professions we can provide. So please put that in. And if you are an other, please feel free to type that into the question box and let us know what other you are. All right, let's see. We've got 73% engineers, 19% code officials, and just a little tiny bit um, of everybody else. So builder, manufacturer, other, 4%, 4% architect, and 1% fire service. No matter who you are, we are delighted that you are here and hope that you find something of value. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Okay, the next poll is where are you located? It's always interesting to see where everybody is located in the audience. And so we go with purple, uh, noted there, Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Wyoming. Uh, the mustard is Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, et cetera. Green is uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, all the way east to Ohio and Kentucky. Teal consider, uh, consists of Florida, Tennessee, North Carolina, Mississippi, and in between that. And then brown is Maine to Virginia. So if you could please respond to the poll. Now, if you aren't in the U.S. and you'd like to share your location, and you're an other, please type that into the chat box. That would be great if you could type that in and let us know where you are. For example, we had someone from the Netherlands that was participating in the webinar. Okay, wow, we have someone from Turkey. Welcome. Cool, welcome. And, e and Egypt. Woo, that's awesome. Canada. Canada. And did you say Canada, Marcy? Yes, I did. Cool. And Puerto Rico? Cool. Okay, I've got a minute and I'm going to go ahead and close. And then let's see where within the contiguous United States we are. Um, purple, or it's 27% in the western um, part of the United States, 30% northeast, and then pretty evenly split between central, midwest, east. So um, 
we are again delighted that you're here across the United States and uh, parts of Europe and Canada. Um, delighted again that you are here spending this time with us. Yes, thank you for participating in the poll. Okay, now a brief overview of how this presentation is going to progress. First, I want to mention that special inspection is typically not required for wood construction, and we'll go over where it is required and what are the limitations that require special inspection. But we're going to look at the history. If you're a nerd like I am, I want to see how codes have progressed and how did what influenced how codes became regarding special inspection and incorporating and, and the timing of everything that happened. Then we'll get into fabricated items, which is to prefabricated and then site built fabricated items. And what are those items that need to have special inspection and the triggers that require the special inspection. And then we'll get into the lateral resisting systems, the ones that resist wind and seismic load. And then we'll take a special look at high load diaphragms because these are, are really provide the engineer and the architect with a tool to provide capacity in their building, higher capacity than a typical diaphragm. And there's some unique it, uh, challenges and special considerations related to high load diaphragms. And then time permitting, we'll look at mass timber construction. We won't go into it too deep, and this really wasn't part of the original presentation, but I thought I would highlight it because some, there's some interesting things going on with tall mass timber, and then more where you can get more information. So starting off with the history, in 19, the 1961 Uniform Building Code, UBC, which is published or was published by the ICBO or the International Conference of Building Officials, included special inspection. And that, I'm not talking about just wood, I'm talking about special inspection alone, but it was for fabricated elements, structural elements. And then it wasn't till 1987 that the NBC National Building Code, which was produced or published by building officials and code administrators uh, is where the, we will see language regarding first the, the first introduction of special inspection. But again, it was only covering, as far as wood is concerned, prefabricated structural elements. And then moving forward, we would see in the 1991 UBC that there is now special inspection related to um, their special inspection, but it's related to prefabricated structural elements, and that's in chapter three. And uh, no special inspection requirements for wood uh, seismic and wind systems, but there is new to UBC structural observations that are required for zone, for zone three and four. If you recall, there was zone one through four and then now it's changed to similar to the seismic design category, but different. But it, anyway, in the 1997 Uniform Building Code, that's where we see a change in the over format, overall format of the code. And um, I think this was in preparation to transitioning to the IBC, but there's a new chapter 17 that includes um, permits and in inspections. And again, no special inspection required for wood construction other than for these prefabricated structural elements. <clears throat> and then under the two of the IBC, now the IBC was first issued in 2000 and it merged ICBO and BOCA, B-O-C-A, um, special inspection requirements into chapter 17. And there was uh, related to quality assurance of seismic and quality assurance of wind resistant systems and special inspection requirements. Now note that I highlighted this. If you're following along in your notes, I, for whatever reason, it didn't get included in your notes, but note that there's a special section for special inspection for seismic resistance in the 2000 IBC. And of course, there's a structural observation that got migrated into the 2000 IBC. 
And now we know throughout the country though, the each state does not all adopt the same code at the same time. So we have the 2000 IBC, then we have the 2003, which now has high low diaphragms. That was new for the 2003. And then when we look at other states, for example, California, the California didn't adopt the IBC until the 2007 California Building Code. So it used the 2006 IBC as its model code. Looking at California alone, you can see the progressions of the California Building Code here. And then back in 1998, the 1998 California Building Code was under the 1997 UBC. And fast forward, it wasn't until 2007 when it incorporated the IBC, 2006 IBC. So no special inspection for wood construction was incorporated until 2007, although structural observation was part of the code. And so I'd like to look back at, okay, what significant effects influence the code and the inclusion of special inspection structural observation? Here are some significant effects. Uh, events that occurred in California, high seismic area, and how that aligns with the actual building code. So we have the 19, 1971 San Fernando earthquake. And then, so we have some new, in the 1987 NBC, we had new special inspection requirements. And then the 1989 Loma, sorry about that, Loma Prieta earthquake, now that triggered us to have some new structural observation in the UBC. And then the 1997 Northridge earthquake, we said some, saw some damage, and that isn't just to wood construction. There was issues with steel moment frames, non-ductile mo concrete moment frames, and then previous ones also had unreinforced concrete that showed some issues. So all of that, and then now under the 2000 IBC or 2007 CBC special inspection is required. There are also, as everybody else in the rest of the country know, issues related to hurricanes. And this just shows you some of the recent hurricanes that occurred. Hurricane Andrew in 1992, which was a category five, and then Hurricane Katrina in 2005, category three. Obviously there's been some other uh, incidents of hurricanes that have occurred after that, but I just wanted to show around where these codes were being developed and adopted. Okay, now we'll get into some overviews, specifically rated, related to fabricated items. In chapter one, we have section on inspections by the building official. So this is totally separate from special inspection. This is frame well, related to wood construction, it would be frame inspection. And as I mentioned, this is inspection done by the building official and uh, not required for, uh, I mean, it's totally separate than special inspection. So they look at it um, such that the work, the construction or work shall be remain accessible and exposed for inspection purposes until approved. That's something that the framing inspection is required uh, to be able to see what is being constructed and not cover it up. It needs to be accessible so that the building official can inspect it. So that's framing inspection and special inspection is typically, it is different from this framing inspection. And again, I want to reiterate the special inspection is typically not going to be required for wood construction. But we'll see in, further in the presentation on when it is required. Okay, looking at the definition of special inspection, going to chapter two, is it, it, special inspection is inspection of construction requiring the expertise of an approved special inspection in order to ensure compliance with this code and approve construction documents. And there's two types of special inspection. You have continuous special inspection and periodic special inspection. Now most, the majority of the inspection if required for wood construction will be periodic inspection. Um, the only thing that's going, the only time that continuous inspection is going to be required is when there's gluing involved. 
And we'll look at that a little later on in the pre presentation. Okay, let me move this. Okay, now the intent of special inspection is to make sure there's a quality measure, control measure in, in place. And as I mentioned previously, it's beyond the inspections, the framing inspections that's done by the building department. And the code official, building official, his, he or she is to enforce the special inspections and ensure the competence of the special inspector. And it makes you wonder, okay, how do you ensure the competence of the special inspector? Well, one, the special inspector qualifications is under 1704.2.1. And one, the building official approves of the approved agency. Now the approved agency can be a special inspector, a uh, registered design professional and responsible for charge, and uh, or an engineer of record. Now note that you could be the regist registered design professional and responsible for charge and engineer of record. So those two types of approved agency can also do structural observation if they're uh, linked with the project, um, engineer of record of the project. So sometimes there's some confusion between structural observation and special inspection because they can do both. But they are two different requirements, two different requirements for requiring special inspection and structural observation. I just want, we'll go over that later. Okay. So the special inspector qualifications, um, the billing official will approve or disapprove of the approved agency, whoever's going to be designated as that person or entity. And then there's experience or training that needs to be submitted for the project to show that they are qualified to do the inspections that they plan to do. And this is going to depend on the complexity of the job, uh, how much inspection is going to be needed, the details and requirement. So it's a conversation between the building official and this approving agency and looking at the construction documents to see how complex that is. There are other, other things that can will specify the type of uh, inspection that will be needed. And then the under 1704 also what is good is that the owner or owner's authorized agents someone other than the contractor will employ the approved agencies i remember hearing stories of that um special inspection is going to be required but then who's going to pay for this and also related to structural observation so no there's language in the code that the owner is required to pay or employ approved agencies. And um, also there are some exceptions to this requirement of special inspection in that minor construction or group U accessory to residential and conventional light frame construction in chapter 23 do not require special inspection. So that's one thing. Uh, there are other areas thresholds for for exception to the rule of requiring special inspection. And then there's a statement of special inspection. What is going to be that there is going to be special inspection and then what needs to be special inspected. So the statement of special inspections uh, are required and the exception to that required statement is conventional light frame construction because there is it's exempt from having requiring special inspection. So the statement of special inspection is going to be prepared by the registered design professional and responsible charge. Uh, and what it will include is it'll basically say the extent, duration, and frequency of the inspection. And so what needs to be inspection, uh, how, how long, what's the extent, how frequent, etc. it needs to be inspected. Now, I, I noticed when I was going through this, there was this staffing of building departments. That is not really supposed to be part of, oops, sorry about that. 
That's not supposed to be part of this statement of special inspection, but this statement on special inspection informs the code official, the building official, uh, on the extent of what is going to be required to have special inspection. And maybe perhaps given the complexity of the job, they need to, it, it tells them, the building department, whether or not they may need to assign more uh, staff to that building to make sure things are done properly, all the submittals are in place, making sure uh, everything is in line for special inspection. Okay, so this statement of special inspection, in addition to that, uh, what's going to be special inspection, the extent, etc., there may be some seismic requirements and wind requirements that need to be included in this statement and special inspection. So if seismic or wind elements of the building, the main wind force resisting system, the seismic for main force resisting system, the components of the wind system, if it's required to be respect, inspected, then that it needs to be included in the statement also. Now, what is also interesting is this contractor responsibility. So the contractor needs to submit a statement of responsibility to the building owner and the code official, stating that he is aware of, he or she, could be a she, is aware of the, is knows about the special inspection, the requirements of the special inspection, and know that they need to provide access to the building to provide that special inspection, et cetera, et cetera. And there are submittals for, to the building official for certificate of compliance. And we'll go over that in more detail in a few more slides. Uh, but of all the certificate of submittals, there's only one of them that would apply to wood construction. And I'll get into that in a few minutes. Okay, so right off the bat, um, we saw that there are some types of wood construction that, is, that does not need to be special inspected. Conventional frame construction does not need special inspection. And then U occupancy does not need to have special inspection. And then also minor structures do not need special inspection. So there's another aspect about special inspection that may require special inspection, and that has to do with fabricated uh, structural load bearing and lateral load resisting systems or assemblies. Now, most wood construction would not need to have that fabricated item special inspected. And we've gotten this question in the past, does glue laminated beam need to be special inspected through eye joys? And the answer is no. And so we'll go through this in um, detail a little bit more. But um, fabrication, that it means that it's on premises of, the, of a fabricator shop, and there are exceptions to this rule. So let's look at this first. What really is the definition of fabricated items? So we look at structural load bearing and lateral load resisting members of assemblies consisting of materials assembly, et cetera, prior to um, being installed in the building. Um, and then there, or subject to operations such as heat treatment, thermal cutting, cold form working, or reforming after manufacture or prior to installation of the building. Well, this second bullet item, most wood structural members do not meet this requirement. Now let's look at the definition of fabricated items. So again, it starts off with that whole structural low bearing, lateral low resisting system, members, et cetera. But then it goes on to say, so materials produced in accordance with standards referenced by this code, and then it says such and such, wood structural panels or in accordance with a reference standard that provides requirements of quality control done under the supervision of third party party control agency are not fabricated items. So wood structural panels, glue lamb, eye joists, they mostly are uh, especially uh, 
sorry about that. Um, it, they're manufactured in accordance to reference standards that are referenced in the code, including cross laminated timber as well is manufactured if you specify in drawings, they will be manufactured by the reference standards in the code. That's why it's, why it's very important when specifying on your drawings that the products that you are specifying are manufactured to the reference standards in the code. Well, one reason why. So those structural members do not fall under the definition of fabricated items. Now, even further than that, if we look at this section that requires special inspection, we would see that it says work is done on the purposes of a fabricator registered approved to perform such work without special inspection. So, so and again, this rough registered is actually stricken out in the 2018, but um, work done on premises, premises of fabricators that they are approved to do work without special inspection. And then the approval consists of a written procedural, quality control, periodic auditing, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all of these wood structural elements or members will most likely be done that they're gonna be done under a fabricator that's been approved to perform that work without special inspection. They'll have a quality control in, in place and um, written procedures for this type of structural element. So these members do not require special inspection, not only because they're not categorized as fabricated items, but also because of these other items as well. So if there are uh, members that meet this under this approval, say, they don't meet the requirements of being a fabricate or meet the requirements of a definition of fabricator, then they would have to meet these other requirements for not requiring special inspection. And then a certificate of compliance will be submitted to the owner and the building official. So looking back, I mentioned that we would get into this more detail. We have 1704.5, which provides a list of submittals to the building official. And these are the certificates of compliance. Now, there was a change from the 2007 to the 2015 that created this new section. And what this new section does is it takes uh, language from other areas within the code and just consolidates it and puts it in this section so that the code official knows that these are the list of submit certificates of compliance that need to be submitted. So these were elsewhere in the code and they've just been brought here just for ease of use and ease of, of for the code official to understand and also the ones that are responsible for submitting their certificates. So I mentioned that wood construction only needs to have certificates of compliance submitted for one item. And this is this first item uh, for fabrication of structural load bearing load, lateral load resisting members and systems, then if required to have certificates of completion, this is the one bullet item that it would be need to be submitted to the building official. All the other items, for example, two is non-structural, and then also three is non-structural items related to seismic systems, um, four has to do with shotcrete, five has to do with open web steel joists, six is related to welding, and then seven has to do with steel construction. So you can see that wood on, for wood construction, only item one applies. Okay, now let's get into a uh, regular inspection, or um, I'm sorry, special inspection for wood construction. And we talked about fabricated items. Those were prefabricated items. Now we'll get into those site built items that are fabricated. And there are two items that are addressed for special inspection. One is high load diaphragms. And we'll get into this more detail later on in the presentation, but high load diaphragms provide 
a capacity of pretty much double what you would see in a regular diaphragm. There are multiple rows of nails and uh, special requirements for the framing members at a panel adjoining edges. And so because of the heavy nailing and the special requirements, special inspection is required and you have a, a high demand on that diaphragm. The other wood where wood construction would come into play has to do with metal plate connected wood trusses. Now this provision came into the code in the 2012 IBC. It wasn't required in the 2009, but in the 2012 it was, it's, was a requirement and it's still the same requirement, no changes in the 2015 IBC. But what it requires is, is that for those trusses that are 60 feet or greater, special inspection is required for the temporary installation of the refrain restraint and bracing and then permanent individual trust members. Um, so 60 feet or greater is needed to have special inspection. And that's in chapter 17, as well as chapter 23. And um, these members, the metal plate connected trusses are really highly engineered wood products and they're engineered to um, that require lateral bracing and when they're in place, they perform very well when they have the proper bracing and the diaphragm to brace it out of plane. But they found that when these were under construction and they didn't have the bracing in place, there can be some challenges, especially when there are high winds. So it was determined to bring in a code change was submitted for those trusses that are over 60 feet to have special inspection. Now, here's something that in the IBC, and um, someone brought this to our attention on the last webinar, but what we see in the IBC, the printed copy of the IBC is this provision for inclusion uh, or expanding the requirements for special inspection for those trusses that are over 60 inches high, regardless of the length of the truss. But what we found is, is that this actually, when it was going through the code change process, there was a submission by NCSEA to change the, make a code change to this 60 inch limitation and to require installation of permanent restraint bracing. But, and the code was permitted, uh, was printed with this code change. But what happened is, while this was going on, NCSCA withdrew their code change. And so now there is an errata to, um, that's published by ICC that states that this code change has been removed. So if you look at your IBC, this is not a requirement. And I believe we have a, well, I'll get that into the q and I'll show you the actual errata that's been uh, submitted. Now, what happened is um, after this with withdrawal, SBCA then worked with NCSEA to introduce prescriptive trust bracing provisions that are added to the wood trust section of chapter 23. And that'll appear in the 2021 IBC, but just a bit of clarification. And so we're still, requiring the in special inspection for installation of permanent, uh, and then during construction, the temporary bracing, uh, the installation for those that are trusses that are 60 feet or greater. Okay, now we'll get into the lateral resisting system. So uh, if you're a, um, Mostly, most of the construction that we see in wood construction would not fall into those categories that we've just listed. Now we'll get into the lateral resisting system and see where, well, other than those metal plate connected trusses, but we'll get into the lateral resisting system and see what are the limitations there. So I wanted to show you that there are definitions for the main wind force resisting system and seismic force resisting system. And notice the difference that this is main wind force 
resisting system and seismic forced resisting system and ASCE 716, which is referenced in the 2018 IBC. The definitions are very, very similar, and uh, although a little bit of different wording at the end of the sentence, but they're pretty much the same. Uh, the wording, though, wind force is one word, the one in ASCE 7 is two words. But it's important to understand what they're talking about related to when they talk about main wind reforce wind force resisting system and seismic force resisting system. And then we get into, now we'll start off with the wind requirements. And special inspection for wind resistance, the triggers are, well, buildings and structures, and then the wind exposure that is exposure category B with the wind speed for allowable stress design greater than 120 miles per hour. And then if you get into category, exposure category C and D, and wind speeds, allowable stress design of 110 miles per hour, this is what will require special inspection. And special inspection, I mentioned previously, is that all most special inspection for wood construction that meet these requirements are going to be periodic inspection except for field gluing operations. Then it's going to require uh, continuous inspection. Now wood construction rarely is going to have that field gluing operations. Um, we'll see a little bit more when we get into mass timber and where that may come into play, but most wood construction is not going to have gluing uh, involved in these type of buildings or wood construction. And then when we get into the main wind force resisting system, and I added here periodic inspection, just to clarify that this is periodic inspection, what we will look at or what are required to be looked at or in special inspection is wood shear walls, wood diaphragms, drag struts, braces, and hold downs. And then nailing, bolting, anchoring, and other fasteners are what need to be special inspection. And there's an expect, uh, exception to requiring this periodic inspection. And that has to do with where fasteners are spaced, um, the fasteners for the sheathing is spaced more than four inches on center. So in other words, six inches on center. Now what uh, we've seen is some, we've seen that sometimes this is expanded to say, okay, well, we have field nailing that's at 12 inches on center, then main, this doesn't have to be special inspected. Well, in the 2018 IBC, that's been clarified. Now look at that in the next section. So the, in addition to the main wind force resisting system, we also have wind resisting components, the roof covering, roof decking, roof framing connections, and the exterior wall covering, wall connections to the roof and the floor diaphragms and floor framing. So when it meets those triggers of the category, exposure category and wind speeds, then that will require this wind inspection. Now I mentioned about the main wind force resisting system. So there's an exception to requiring special inspection and that is if you're sheathing, nailing, exceeds four inches on center, so six inches on center. And what the intent of this is, is at the panel edges. It doesn't mean the field nailing. So if you have uh, shear walls with edge nailing at six inches on center, or if you have diaphragms with the edge nailing and boundary nailing at six inches on center, then special inspection is not required. Okay, let's look at seismic and what that looks like. Okay, right off the bat, seismic resisting systems, the, main, the structural seismic resisting systems does not require special inspection if you have light frame construction and then your, uh, sorry about this, your design Spectral response acceleration at short periods, that's the S of DS is less than 0.5. And then the height of the building is less than 35 feet. Then light frame construction does not require special inspection. 
And then also, if you have one and two family dwellings that are less than two stories, and there's no uh, horizontal or vertical irregularities, then special inspection is not required. And those vertical and horizontal irregularities are per ASCE 7. So no requirement, no special inspection for light frame construction. Then what does require special inspection is the seismic design buildings that are in seismic design category C, D, E, N, F. Uh, the cutoff is C, and then um, only the only portion that's going to require continuous inspection is going to be the field gluing operations, if in fact there are any. Most aren't going to have any. Now the field gluing is going to be those systems that rely on that field gluing to resist lateral loads, um, uh, or yeah, lateral loads. And then the others are periodic inspection that is the seismic forced resisting systems that includes the wood shear walls, wood diaphragms, drag struts, braces, and hold downs. Very similar to what is seen for wind design or wind requirements. So that includes nailing, bolting, anchoring, and other fasteners. And for the seismic force resisting system, there is also the limit uh, exception to the rule where special inspection is not required, and that is if the sheathing is more, in four, more than four inches on center, the nailing of those fasteners. Now note I mentioned in the 2018 IBC, they clarified that that's at panel edges for that four inches on center, but for some whatever reason, they didn't clarify that in the seismic portion of special inspection. But the intent of this is that it is at the panel edges that four inches on center, not the field nailing. I think they picked it up or in the 2021 IBC, and I'm not sure if there was an errata that was submitted to clarify that, but certainly it's that panel edges. For those of you that aren't familiar with wood construction, this is a plan view of say a roof or a floor where we have a diaphragm and um, imagine if there was a shear wall below here and a shear wall below here, that's where we have our boundary nailing. And then we have our wood structural panels that are typically installed staggered. Sometimes they may not say they're a penalized roof system where they're all aligned. We have our continuous panel edges, which may have different nailing. And then we have our panel edge nailing at adjoining panel edges where we have two panels together. This is adjoining panel edges. And then we have our field nailing. And then if we're talking about a shear wall, if this was an eight foot high play height, we would have a four by eight panel. We have an adjoining panel edge here that comes in the nailing on a, a, a common member. And this is, has edge nailing, we have field nailing, wood structural panel, uh, anchor bolts that resist that in-plane load, transfers it to our foundation. And then we have our hold downs that resist that overturning. And then our boundary elements that resist that bending of that shear wall. <clears throat> so we mentioned also about components and the resist the requirement for uh, special inspection were certain cases where the components need to be uh, special inspected and the diaphragms that need to be special inspected. Well, there's something that is new to the 2018 NDS having to do with failure modes of when we have suction up on this roof. Say this is a roof diaphragm, the wind load pulls up on that wood structural panel and wanna, wants to uplift it. Well, we do uh, check this resistance as engineers for withdrawal of the nail from this wood member, say it's a rafter. And now new to the NDS, we're also checking a failure mode of where we might have a nail head pull through. That's where this wood structural panel will pull up and there's a concentrated failure mode right around that nail head. So when spe special inspection is required, we want to make sure that the nails are uh, the proper nails on the job site to make sure that we get the proper nails 
on the job type that are specified on the drawings. And um, the one thing that I didn't mention at the beginning of the presentation is not only are we going through the provisions of the actual requirements in the code, but we're providing, we're, we, me, is going to provide you with some information on why special detailing is required and what to look at if it is required to be special inspected. Now, I mentioned nails, and a good resource for nails and uh, what is assumed in the NDS or, or provided in the NDS and the wind and seismic provision or special design provisions for wind and seismic, that we have tables that provide specific information on the nails that are specified in, say, the diaphragm tables or the shear wall tables. So on the drawings, you want to avoid not getting the proper nails out there, so you want to specify the penny weight, the type, say common or galvanized box nails, the diameter, that's a diameter of the head and the shank, and the length of the nail to make sure you get the nail that's specified in your calculations or used in your calculations. And then we have a new table in the NDS, the roof sheathing ring shank nail that's actually been used in the industry for some time but it makes its appearance in the 2018 NDS and really provides a high capacity that's needed in the really high wind areas where we really have high winds that's going to have a high demand on that roof sheathing and the nailing and with related to withdrawal. Okay, so we talk about components and the lateral resisting system. Again, we're dealing with wind and wind uplift and making sure that our components of our building stay together when we're in that high demand of our structure. Now, this was new to the wind and seismic provisions. We had the 2015 wind and seismic provisions. And remember, the previous addition to that was the 2008. So we had some pretty good changes in the 2015 wind and seismic provisions. One of them is this, related to uplift force resisting systems and the inclusions and the requirements for if we have metal straps that provide that continuity of our wood structural, of our wood structure and continuing our load path to the foundation. <clears throat> so what we're talking about is if we have uplift on this uh, wood roof, and that wood roof or the wood structural panel is connected to the rafters, we want to make sure that rafter is connected all the way down so it has resistance all the way down to the uh, foundation to resist that load. And if special inspection is required, we want to make sure those straps are all continuous down, all the way down through to the foundation. And making sure they meet the construction documents that were submitted and permitted and built according to those documents. Again, this is a shear wall, just another graphic showing what a shear wall is. This one happens to be an eight by four shear wall. We have our in-plane shear resisted by our anchor bolts and our wood structural panel. And then we have all the nails that make up the connection from our wood structural panel to our wood framing members. And that provides our ductility in our system, all the nails that, that resist that uh, lateral load. So just to give you an example, maybe some of you have already seen this before, but just to give some background on some of the detailing that's required and if special inspection is required, why are we looking at this and what, what, what's the detailing requirements? So this shows you uh, in seismic resistance, we are very interested in load deformation performance. So here's an example of an eight foot by eight foot wall that was tested cyclically using Curie cyclic protocol. So one characteristic that is very beneficial for wood frame walls is the ability to displace without failure. And that's what this shows. So this happens to be a test that was performed back in 2005. 
what we see is on the horizontal axis displacement, on the vertical axis we have load. So as the load is applied back and forth, we see here uh, that the shear wall has displaced greater than three inches. So that's great. Um, so at peak load, it's the wall displaced three inches and three inches is a great displacement. Um, this drift capacity that um, is close to about 3%, which is what we found through looking at other system tested that this is a very good drift capacity uh, looking at other systems. Now what we designed to is somewhere around here in this area. So you can see we have quite a bit of capacity in our shear wall before it even fails. And there's a lot of ductility in there and that ductility is provided by the nails. And then we see a drop off here in our, when a load is applied, it can, it, we have a drop off and that's where we see a failure in our shear wall. And that's good because it's way beyond what we actually designed for and it's also a very, a ductile failure. So failure is good in this case, because we wanna see what will happen. Now, what we see is these are post peak failure of the sheathing, the nail sheathing. And um, at the adjoining panel edges where we had those four by four uh, foot panels and they adjoined on a panel edges, we have nail withdrawal at the adjoining panel edges, which is good. That's a ductile failure, the nails yielded. And then also at the sill plate where we have nail head pull through at the bottom, on, bottom of the uh, shear wall. And again, that is a nail having already yielded at post peak. So really good results that we see. So, I'll carry this information more into the presentation, but one thing I wanted to point out is, and I talked about nails, and we're going to um, also mention that in this, these are the tables that we go to to get our capacity of our shear walls. It's a nominal unit shear capacity, so it can be used for both LRFD and ASD design. So if we're doing ASD design, we want to divide by two to get in, into an allowable stress design. But also note that it says common nail sizes. That's a common nail and it's eight penny. And then there's a minimum penetration of say one and three eighths. We also have the minimum panel thickness, the framing members, et cetera, at the adjoining panel edges. Same is true for when we talk about our diaphragms where we say, I mean, our shear walls, where we say nails are common or galvanized box nails, eight penny, six penny, whatever. And then our minimum fastener penetration, which is one and three eighths. Now to utilize this, these two tables, the nails need to meet all three criteria. They need to be common, or galvanized box nails. They need to be of the fastener type and size, which is the eight penny. And then they need to have the minimum penetration, all three. So in other words, it just can't meet the same, pen that minimum penetration be same diameter that, that doesn't meet the criteria of these tables. It's gotta be a common or a galvanized box nail for the shear walls and then a common nail for the diaphragm. The one thing that we have seen uh, that may occur is when we have closely spaced nails, there can be some challenges and I'll, I'll go over these challenges. But if you imagine wood and you look at it under a microscope, you would see long tubular light cells. And those cells can be modeled as if they're straws. So you have your wood, in the east to west direction or the left to right direction. And we have these bundles of straws and each of these is say a wood cell. And we're simplifying this really, making it simple just to, to um, give an example of what can happen. What can happen is if we have a nail that's driven in here and then another nail that's driven in here, that could cause some perpendicular grain 
uh, tension and exceed the capacity of what's connecting these bundles of cells together. And so another example shown here, a physical example, is that splitting is caused by exceeding that tension perpendicular to a grain. So we have a closely spaced snail and the straws are up and down the page and it can act like a wedge. And so the main reason these wood splitting can occur is because of exceeding that tension perpendicular to a grain. So the installation requirements that we have in the uh, wind and seismic provision <laughs> is uh, deemed to be adequate to mitigate against this splitting that may occur. So when, that's why we wanna have staggered nails when they're closely spaced. So you have a nail here, then there would be a nail here, and then the next nail would be here because we're staggering it with a grain of the wood. One here, one here, and one here. So the next slide is gonna be a test to see how many of you are paying attention. <laughs> and it's not really a test, I'm only kidding. But um, so we have two graphics and I show this slide, I've shown it across the country. And we have people that say that the left diagram is staggered nailing and we have the diagram on the right that's staggered nailing. So I'll give you a little bit of chance to look at that. We have the panels that there's a joint here. And imagine there's a three by behind here, the straws are up and down. And then in this one, the panel joint is here. We have a three or a four by, or even a two by are uh, up and down. Of these two diagrams or figures, which one is staggered nailing? And I can tell you that some people will say this is staggered, but this is not staggered. And this is staggered because we don't want the nails, if they are closely spaced, to be all in line with those straws to induce that tension perpendicular to grain. This is an example of staggering of the nails where we're staggering it with the grain of the wood that helps mitigate against splitting. Now, there are specific requirements in the wind and seismic provisions, which requires uh, some three by members. And this is to mitigate against splitting of the wood, et cetera, et cetera. So in the footnotes of wood shear walls, we have footnote six that states that where we have shear walls on both sides and the nail spacing is less than six inches on center, then the panel joints need to be offset or a three by member is required. And sorry, there's a duplicate uh, cation of the slide. That's the same slide. So here's what I'm talking about, where we have wood structural panel shear walls on this side and this side. If the adjoining panel edges, here's a wood structural panel and here's a wood structural panel, there's adjoining panel edges, and it's a double-sided shear wall, three by framing or blocking is required. And then also where we have, if you don't want to make that a requirement, then it needs to be specified that the panel edges need to be, where they're adjoining needs to be staggered. So one, you would think as an engineer or architect, are we gonna be assured that these panel, adjoining panel edges, they're gonna align or not align on the same member? And um, notice also the angle of the nails to meet the edge distance requirement of the wood structural panel if we're dealing with a two by member. But there is also, if three bys are not readily available, you can also have two two bys provided they are connected together to provide that continuous low path. So we're talking about, here's an example of an load applied at the top of the wall and we're resisting the overturning here and here and the panel joint is here, the adjoining panel edges where these shear walls connect together. And 
this is just a graphic uh, to say that if we have a lateral load, it's going to be applied to the wood framing members. The uh, panels, the wood structural panels, are going to lift that load, and actually they're going to go in the opposite direction. That animation didn't come out the way I wanted it to, but the wood structural panels are going to resist that load. They're not going to go with the load. They're going to resist it, and there is uh, edge nailing that's going to be required, field nailing here, and the panel joint here is where we can have some challenges, and we saw this in past earthquakes, and that's why we are having some requirements for detailing requirements at that adjoining panel edges, and where it states that in this is a, a separate requirement than where we have wood structural shear walls on both sides of the wall. This is where we have nailing at two inches on center or 10 penny nails at three inches on center or less, or the nominal unit shear capacity of either side exceeds um, 700 pounds per linear foot at um, seismic design category D, E, and F. So this would apply for wind design as well, where you have nails spaced at two inches on center or your 10 penny nails at three inches on center. Now note that I struck out this here language, having penetrations of more than one and a half inches. This is going to be clarified in the 2021 wind and seismic provisions. Because when you think about it, a 10 penny common nail, which is three inches, is going to have a penetration of one and a half inches. And because your wood structural panel is gonna be half inch or whatever, but you're going to exceed this one and a half inches with a 10 penny common nail. So that language is struck out. It's 10 penny common nails at three inches on center or less is going to require a three by member. And again, you, if three by members are not easily readily available and you wanna provide an option of two two bys, that is permitted, which is shown here in these sections where common framing members, two two bys are permitted to replace three bys, and then shear wall systems also, two two by permitted to replace three bys. And in the commentary of both of these sections, it provides specific requirements for the connection of those two two by members. And the reason why they allow these two two bys is they found through cyclic testing that these shear wall, uh, the cyclic testing shear walls confirms that the two two bys perform uh, as well as the three by related to the um, inclusion of this allowing two two bys. And the key is again connecting those two two bys and making sure we have the nailing or screws of the two two bys together, the na edge nailing into the two bys. This is a handy table that you can use as a guideline. This was created by Phil Line, our seismic guru, wind guru, that um, um, provided this as a tip for you. Um, he basically just went to the NDS, found the capacity for the nails, and found out the what it would be for certain nailing and the requirements um, based on the panel edge nailing of a shear wall and what you would need to connect the two two bys together. Now, if you get really closely spaced nails, you want to go, you may want to go to screws to avoid any splitting or or challenges with the closely spaced nails and um, definitely want to stagger them when they get closely spaced. The other it, um, challenge that we've seen in the past from past earthquakes has to do with cross grain bending or and um, of our sill plates and where special inspection is required you want to check that bottom plate connection and I'll get into more detail but what happens is is here we have a sill plate we have a wood structural panel shear wall and when there is a lateral load applied to this what could happen is this wood structural panel will lift up and then induce cross grain bending into this sill plate. So AWC and this bottom plate issue became noticeable, very noticeable after the Northridge earthquake. 
and where some plates had shown evidence of failure. And so AWC did some research testing over 50 tests that uh, this is a mock of the test that you see on the right, small kit scale tests. And this uh, instrument applies a vertical load to uh, mirror what occurred out in the after during an earthquake. And you see this mode one where we have some splitting of the wood structure of the uh, sill plate which can be calculated. You can predict that when that will happen, shown here. But then there's a horizontal splitting that occurs also after some tests, depending on the um, a load that's applied that cause that mode one failure. And so, as I mentioned, we can predict when this can occur, but we can't really predict or provide calculations for when this occurs currently. And so that's why after many tests, over 50, the solution became this uh, plate, that steel plate washer. And you can see here's just a results after a bottom plate where we have round washer and splitting that occurred. And then uh, the highest capacity shear wall and the wind and seismic provisions. And where we see that the plate washer was able to resist that cross grain bending and no issue with the plate. So now we have three by three by 0.229, that's to be in line with gauge type steel and a slotted holes are permitted so that the washer can be moved to align with the half inch requirement from the sheathing. And um, for a two by four wall that meets the requirements automatically. And um, for two by six, by having a three by washer, that's not going to meet the requirements automatically. So that slotted hole will uh, be able to help move that washer into a half an inch from the edge of the wall or where the wood structural panel is. Now, if you don't want to use these plate washers, there are some exceptions to requiring these washers and that is a standard washer can be used if the anchor bolts are designed to resist shear only and then hold downs are designed to neglect uplift and the aspect ratio of the shear wall is less than or equal to two to one and then there's thresholds for the nominal shear capacities for both wind and seismic so this requirement for plate washers is not just for seismic it's also for wind design and if special inspection is required, then the, these should be checked. So we have a poll question and we'll go through it. And the poll question is special inspection may be required for vertical ladder resisting systems located in seismic design category A, B, C, and D seismic design category B, C, D, and E, and F, wind exposure category C and D, and wind speeds for allowable stress design or allowable stress design wind speed of 110 mile per hour, all of the above, and B and C. Still having trouble um, with their poll questions because not I don't have that many people voting so it's either really hard or poll questions aren't working or both um, but I'm going to close it because it's been a little bit um, I think part of it is I mentioned this much earlier in the presentation so uh, that could be too so 56% say answers B and C 20% all of the above and 22% uh, answer C so I'm gonna send it back to you, Michelle, and you can discuss this answer. Yes, this is a little tricky. So the answer is wind exposure, category C and D, and then the speed, wind speed of 110 miles per hour. Now it's nice that they said seismic design category B, C, D, and E, and F, but actually it's only C, D, E, and F. For those in seismic design category B, 
and meet the other requirements, special inspection is not required. The threshold is C. So that's a little bit tricky. I know when we include all of the above or B and C, some people may think, oh, it's one of those, but it, it's a little tricky. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, now we'll get into high-low diaphragms, and we'll, I'm going to breeze through this because we're running up on time. Um, I was going a little slower than I expected, but high-low diaphragms um, provide engineers and architects with the tool on getting higher capacity out of those wood diaphragms. They are typically used in panelized roof systems and what we see here, where we have tilt-up concrete walls, sometimes you'll have masonry walls, and they are very large buildings. The concept for panelized roof structure or roof systems is that they are constructed on the ground, which makes it very safe and very fast to construct. And they are then lifted into place and then uh, connected on the roof. So this shows an all wood system. I think the majority of these panelized roof systems are actually going to be sub purlins of two by four, two by six at 24 inches on center, wood structural panels as the diaphragm and then steel bar joists. Here you see that uh, they have the sub purlins that are ready to go. These are already constructed and nailed. And then you have this being lifted up here with forklifts into place. And then we have someone welding it off the bar joist, steel bar joist on top. And then another person that is nailing that panel to the adjacent panel. And I had a video, but I'm not gonna show it because we are short on time. It was a pretty cool video. It shows the process of it. And then I'll skip that. So uh, special inspection is required for high-low diaphragms, regardless of whether or not you're in a certain seismic design category or wind area. It, the fact that it is a high-low diaphragms requires special inspection. And what we inspect are we want to make sure that the wood structural panel is the correct wood structural panel that is specified on the drawings. And to see that, you would see these grade stamps. This is an example of one by APA. And then that shows the panel thickness, the panel rating, the APA trademark, bond classifications, dimensional thickness designations. Then we have manufactured standard. This is PS2-10, which is 2010. And that's the manufacturing standard that it was manufactured under and then performance category. And then we also, that's commonly shown, uh, used out there on the TECO products wood structural panel, where it provides all of the information that you would see that's needed to special inspect the wood structural panel. In addition to that, we wanna make sure that we have the nails that we are, that are specified in the calculations and drawings and make sure those nails are the ones that are out in the field. Now, this is the uh, high-low diaphragm table. And as you can see, there's nominal thicknesses of our members that are joining panel edges. We have two or three lines of fasteners, and then we have the common nails, they have to be common nails, minimum penetrations, and 10 penny. So all of these three criteria, common, 10 penny, and minimum penetration. And I mentioned nails, if you just say 10 penny common nail or 12 penny, you may not get the nail that you're specifying on in your calculations, you may not get that out on the field. So it's to avoid any problems with specifying nails, specify the penny weight, type, diameter, that's head and shank, and then the length. And all of this information is in the NDS or the wind and seismic provisions. And again, we still have, we have the new addition of the roof sheathing ring shank nails. So that doesn't show up, but that shows the two different tables 
that are in the NDS and the uh, wind and seismic provision. They're the same tables, they're just designated with a different table L4 versus table A1, but they're identical. I mentioned lines of fasteners, so at the panel edges, we can have two lines of fasteners that are staggered. And then at adjoining panel edges, we have a three by nominal with two lines of fasteners. And then we have a four uh, by required for two lines or three lines of fasteners at the adjoining panel edges. And to make that point, this is a section through a high load diaphragm where we have in a panel here and a panel here, and this is the adjoining panel edges where two by members are not going to um, meet the requirements for high load diaphragms. For regular diaphragm it may, but not high load diaphragms. We wanna have that three by member and or four by member for high load diaphragms. I also have a video, but I'm gonna skip this. And uh, at the panel edges, we are wanting to Make sure we check that boundary nailing. This one shows that a concrete tilt-up panel where the framer is installing the nails, or actually in that case, it was shot pins. Example of a typical panelized roof system. And this happens to be shot pins that are being installed in through this strap, through the wood structural panel into a steel ledger. And you can see from special inspection or even structural observation where the penetration of the nail has not met the requirements. So all of these shot pins are not meeting the required embedment. So those of you who are not familiar with these type of buildings, what another challenge that we've seen and structural demand on the high load diaphragms is anchoring that wall into the diaphragm. So if an earthquake occurs, that panel will want to pull away from the diaphragm. And that can be a challenge. And we've seen from past earthquakes where it wasn't detailed properly or designed properly. And new to the wind and seismic provisions is this requirement of anchoring of the concrete or masonry walls into the diaphragm. And this is for seismic design category E, C, D, E, N, F. And the requirement of continuous ties and how to analyze this related to sub diaphragms, um, anchorage of the wall into the diaphragm. So some people may say, well, wait, wait, that's not new. Well, you're right, it isn't new. It was in the IBC and it's been an ASCE 7, but it is new to the 2015 wind and seismic provision and goes into detail on the requirements. So if special inspection is required and if you have a high load diaphragm, it will be required that there are certain aspects of it. To provide you with some background on these, high, these diaphragms that resist that out of plane load, what the code states is, is that the, there needs to be connections from the wall all the way across the building. So we have these sub purlins, say they were two by four or two by sixes that are connected to these purlins. And we have the sub purlins, the wall is connected to these sub purlins. Then the requirement requires that all of these sub purlins need to be connected across the building which would require something for this particular building of 1800 connections, which would add a lot of costs and not a lot of efficiency in the construction, in the design, et cetera, et cetera. So what the provisions state that is that you can analyze this or design this with sub diaphragms. And so instead of treating this as all one big diaphragm, what we have is a sub diaphragm here, here, and here. And so it acts like a beam that spans from this shear wall to this collector and checking this to make sure that when this wall is anchored to this diaphragm and it wants to pull away from the load, it doesn't exceed the capacity of this diaphragm. And then that is connected to this wall and these collectors. 
and also that those collectors all are tied across the building. So these are our main ties across the building. Now the sub diaphragms, uh, the spacing of the anchorage cannot exceed four feet on center unless this wall is designed to span horizontally between the connectors. So most engineers are gonna have these at four feet on center anchoring that wall into the diaphragm. And then the aspect ratio of these sub diaphragms uh, are, are two and a half to one. That's the maximum aspect ratio. So the sub diaphragm, um, there it shows the two and a half to one lateral loads. And instead of having 1800 connectors, we now have 102 connectors and connecting all across. And in the normal, same thing, we can treat this as a sub diaphragm and connecting it across the building. It's not as much of a challenge as we do have in the other direction, but um, as far as number of connections, but still we wanna treat the sub diaphragms spanning between these two and then connecting across. So the window seismic provisions has some figures in the commentary to explain this a little bit more and give you examples of two to one ratios, et cetera, et cetera, and meeting the requirements in the provisions. And when we talk about anchoring, what we've seen is that there has been some failures when the wall has not been anchoring into the, the roof diaphragm enough. So in this case, it relied only on the boundary nailing to transfer the load of this wall into the diaphragm. And that requires, uh, induces cross grain bending tension into that ledger. So that is a no-no, that is not allowed. It specifically states that in the provisions. So we wanna have this positive connection of this anchorage from the wall into the purlin or whatever framing member, and then make sure that that purlin or framing member has nailing to transfer that load up into the diaphragm. And this anchorage into this framing member needs to be double-sided to provide concentric loading on that framing member, or if there's only one sided anchorage, then that needs to be taken into account in the design of this member because it will apply an eccentric load to that wood member if there's only one sided. Similarly, where we're tying across the building, we wanna have that anchorage across and we don't wanna rely on that nailing here, which is potential for splitting due to tension perpendicular to grain. Okay, I'm gonna skip this one, but the right answer is A and B. Um, this says inspections of high low diaphragms when it's required. Um, this says wood structural panel width and depth. And when I'm talking about depth, I'm not talking about the thickness, I'm talking about in plan view depth. Uh, that's not part of the special inspection, it's just the nail diameter length, spacing, and the framing member at adjoining panel edges. That's required special inspection for high low diaphragms. Okay, I'll go over this quickly because um, I added this into the presentation just to make you aware. It wasn't really originally part of the presentation, but ICC has been working with AWC on tall mass timber construction and the creation of some guidelines related to mass timber construction, tall buildings of mass timber construction. And for those that aren't aware, there is a new type of construction under the 221, I mean the 2021 IBC that is type 4A, type 4B, and type 4C with varying degrees of fire protection, fire, um, and then also exiting hoistway closures, also the type of materials permitted, and whether or not they need to be covered up, all kinds of varying degrees of um, requirements. Oops, sorry about that. And so we have now type 4A, type 4B, and type 4C. Now that does not mean that there is not a type 4, but there is a type 4 heavy timber. It's just been renamed to type 4 heavy timber. 
So mass timber construction would come under type 4A, type 4B, and type 4C, and there are some special requirements related to special inspection for these new types of mass timber construction. And I won't go into much detail, but here's a picture, a cover of the related to the 2021 code and uh, there will be a publication on mass timber construction. Uh, I believe the electronic version will come out in mid-June and be available on the ICC website. And then we'll, the hard copy will be coming out later than that. But ICC and uh, AWC has been presenting on mass timber construction for ICC. They, they're gonna start a new series in May to cover mass timber construction. And then we're also going to have more webinars on mass timber construction starting in August also to cover aspects of mass timber construction. So more to look forward to. But we have a new table related to the requirements of special inspection for mass timber construction in chapter 17. And note, similar to regular wood construction, we have periodic inspection is um, if special inspection is required, it's going to be mostly periodic special inspection. And only where there are adhesive involved is where continuous inspection is required. And um, related to connections of the, the mass timber construction, tall mass timber construction, related to connectors, and only continuous inspection is required where there's adhesives involved, similar to what you would see for precast concrete, or even if you have uh, anchors that are using epoxy into concrete requires some type of special inspection or may require, so similar to that. And then there's special sealing of mass timber construction. When that is required to have a special sealing, then periodic inspection will be required of that and sealing at adjacent wood structure, I mean, uh, mass timber elements where we have a panel that are connecting together where uh, special inspection is required that sealant and adhesives will be required to have special inspection. And as I mentioned, for fabricated items, it's similar to glue laminated timber beams and similar to eye joists where they fall under the definition of not being a fabricated item in addition to the fabrications that have been approved by the code official to do fabrication without special inspection, then special inspection is not required. Um, then other, when related to structural observation may be required for these tall mass timber construction. If they are in categorized as high rise. Now this is not specific to tall wood, tall mass timber. Um, this applies to all types of construction, not just wood and not just tall mass timber, where high rise is going to require structural observation. Okay, so where can we get more information? There's an article that is co-authored by myself, Dave Tyree and James Smith all from American Wood Council that was published in Structure Magazine on the 2015 IBC. We haven't updated it to the 2018 IBC, but we may do it for the 2021 since now we have mass timber construction. And then there's some SEOC proceedings that also has information related to special inspection. Okay, let's see, Lori, are you there? Just want to go I just an overview. So special inspection. Well, I'll go ahead and let you uh, uh, talk. Yeah, about we questions. <laughs> you, you probably thing... know what I'm going to ask from what we talked about earlier today. So um, where we could start with um, some of the definitions, maybe contrasting special inspection with other methods of observation such as structural observation that are required in the code. Um, okay. I, I... So, yeah, I want to reiterate that there's inspection by the building official, which is in chapter one. There's a framing inspection that is a requirement for permitted wood buildings. Special inspection is totally separate from that. 
and special inspection is typically not going to be required for wood buildings but there are special requirements that we went over throughout the presentation that may require a wood building to be special inspected and there are caveats to that requirements such as if it's uh, the spacing of the wood structural panel shear wall or diaphragm is greater than four inches on spinner then special inspection is not required and um, the seismic design category is less than c then special inspection is not required provided the wind doesn't trigger it as well so we have the framing inspection by the building official we have special inspection that may be required and then we have structural observation that may be required as well and or not and the triggers are shown here i had this up for because we were talking about it earlier is there's been a little bit of change regarding structural observation and what it states is is that structural observation is required for structures in classific that are classified as risk category four and then structures that are high rise so one more or the one or more of these exist it's going to require structural observation now there was some limitations previous to this where it mentioned if it was high rise but not in risk category or one or the other. Anyway, it's gonna be required if you meet one of these or more. So risk category four or high rise. And then um, it says structural observation is required for a registered design professional who is a responsible charge for the structural design. And then, um, or if it's such observation is required by the building official. So this is a little bit different than what was in the 2015 uh, IBC. And then the thresholds for requiring for the seismic resisting systems or the wind resistance is a little bit different as well than for special inspection. And um, for example, for the wind, it's based on the um, a V or basic wind speed of 130 miles per hour whereas for triggering special inspection for wind it was based on the v asd of i can't remember depending on the uh, category exposure category um, like exposure category b it was 120 miles and um, for exposure category c or d it was 110 miles per hour so different um, thresholds for requiring structural observation than what was required for special inspection for both the wind and seismic. And there may be some confusion because some people may think, well, structural observation is special inspection, but they're two different requirements. Now, what may be catching people up is that the engineer or design professional and responsible charge can do the special inspection if approved by the building official. So that may be why there may be some confusion. And Michelle, I'm actually going to use that, uh, that to segue into our next question. So there was some questions on who is uh, who is qualified to do these special inspections and how how would someone go about determining that? Oh, that is a good question. But can I hold on that question? I just wanted to show sure. this and then I'll go to my presentation. So, sorry about that. Oh yeah, this is an important one. Yeah. Absolutely. So I mentioned about uh, metal plate connected trusses and the requirement of special inspection for metal plate, uh, plate connected trusses, getting all tongue tied and the 60 foot limitation. And then in the 2018 IBC, regardless of length of truss, was introduced a code change for the height of the truss. If it was 60 inches or greater, then that would trigger special inspection. But what happened is, is while the code changes were being, um, during the code change hearings, NCSEA, or a committee, I believe it was, introduced this 
code change to include this 60 inch minimum. And while the printing of the IBC was going on, the code change was withdrawn by NCSEA. So it got printed with this 60 inch and that would require special inspection, but there was an errata that was withdrawn and there was a, an errata that was submitted. And now, and this is the picture of the errata that clarifies that that 60 inch is not a requirement to trigger special inspection. So it's only the span that, and let me go to that slide here, hold on a second. Let's go to here so I can get to it. And let's see if I, yeah. Okay, slideshow from current slide. So here, this is what I'm talking about here. So metal plate connected trusses uh, for 60 feet and greater, and it had this overall height of the truss is greater than 60 inches. The IBC was printed with this requirement, then, but then that requirement was actually the change code change proposal with, was withdraw and, by NCSEA and NCSEA then worked with NCSEA or CBCA worked with NCSEA to introduce the prescriptive truss bracing provisions that will occur um, will be in chapter 23 of the 2021 IBC. Hopefully this doesn't cause any confusion. Okay, so threshold, 60 feet, anything greater than 60 feet, greater than or equal to 60 feet will require installation of permanent restraint and bracing. And then during construction, temporary installation or restraint bracing and this 60 inches does not come into play. All right. Let's do one more question and then I think we can uh, let oh, everybody get back. Oh, sorry, was there more? Yeah, you wanted me to tell you about requirements. Oh, right, yes. Okay, so I think it's on, right. So the, Building official is one of the roles is to enforce special inspection and to ensure competence of the special inspectors. So first, there's a, a, what's called a approved agency that the building official will, uh, they will submit their experience and training and the building official will say, this is the official approved agency for uh, doing the special inspection on the job. Now the approved agency can be a special inspector, a registered design professional in responsible charge or an engineer of record, and they will be designated as a special inspector. And during this process of submitting all the paperwork and showing their experience, they'll submit their experience and training to the building official to prove that they are qualified to meet the requirements of special inspection and have the ability to special inspect. So the code official, will, uh, building official, will be hopefully familiar with the project and see how complex that project is. And based on that, determine what more information is uh, needed or, or experience is needed for that special inspector to be required to do that job. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sorry, I was on mute there. <laughs> uh, all right. One more question, and then I think we can uh, call it a day. We've got uh, a lot of great questions, and thank you, everybody, for submitting them. The last one, um, can you talk about scheduling of the inspections with regard to points during the construction schedule? Uh, you know, are they scheduled every week? Are they scheduled when the construction kind of moves from one phase to another? Um, can you can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? I think one of the areas that this would be covered in is the statement of special inspections. 
So the statement of special inspection is prepared by the registered design professional in responsible charge. And they will state the extent, the duration, and the frequency and what needs to be special inspection because they are the one that are most familiar with the project. So th there may be some complex details that they would like to have special inspected and um, that will show what needs to be inspected and this is where pre-construction meetings are very important and getting involved with the contractor, the code officials, and really having that conversation with the contractor to say, I need to special inspect these elements of the building. They can't be covered up. And before and previously in the presentation, I mentioned that the contractor needs to submit in writing that they are aware of these. They understand that there are special inspection required. They need to provide access to the special inspector and allow time for that special inspection to be done before things are covered up. Now, I know some engineers or architects put on their drawing that need, they need to be no, uh, notified 48 hours in advance when special inspection is required because we know all jobs may not be on schedule, so they're, they're, they can't really, really say, okay, these shear walls are going to be completed. There may be phases in a project um, where shear or delays in a project, and it's that real communication with a contractor and the framer on when things may be completed and making the whoever is going to be doing the special inspection aware of all of this. Okay, I think that's it. Is that it? I I think that's enough for today. I want to again thank everybody for your questions and for your attendance. And thank you, Michelle, for a great presentation and also Marcy for helping out with everything today.